Cool. Well, well, how about a little tour? Yeah, let me um, do that. And okay. then I introduce you to each person. Please. And you can, you are welcome. I've told everybody what you're doing here today. Yeah. Um, you can record anything you want Great. all day today. Um, photo, video, audio, Great. whatever you want. So I just landed in Indianapolis. I'm here to meet a team of people, not just the one or two I typically interview. This team is making their first full-length feature documentary. Of course, I could have met with the people leading the film and the team, but the story involves people in different ways, and I think they'll have different perspectives and thoughts to share. And I'm curious how the topic of the film might be changing the life for each of the people involved. Okay, before I get much further, I'm still at the airport and I need to go get my rental car and head over to my friend's house. The thing about my traveling adventures, I'm usually staying in hotels, but I'm lucky enough to have a friend here that I haven't actually even seen in years. David and his husband, Jason, invited me to come stay with them and even show me around town. Not only am I meeting amazing people with big stories on these adventures, but sometimes I'm able to reconnect with people and see a new part of their world in a new way. Okay, let's go. This is My Big Story, and I'm Christopher Swan. I mentioned I'm interviewing a team, not just one or two people like I normally do. And that team is at 12 Stars Media. They're a video agency, and that means companies hire them to make videos about their stories. But this team is now making a documentary film, Finding Huga. Huga, spelled H-Y-G-G-E, is a Danish word. It's a way of living that's integrated into the Dane's life, or rather, it's a feeling that's incorporated into life, and it can manifest in different ways. Oftentimes, it's referred to as a feeling of cozy or togetherness or well-being, but that's not entirely it, and I know I'm not doing it justice, but I'm not alone. Many of us in the U.S. and other parts of the world have even heard about Huga yet, and when they do, it can be tough to explain. And that's when 12 Stars comes in. They're investigating Huga and want to tell the world about it. And I'm super curious about Huga and why this video agency has decided to dive into it and make a full-length documentary on their own money and on their own time. I'll be meeting with Rocky Walls and Zach Downs, the founder of 12 Stars Media, and I'll be hanging out with the various team members throughout the day. I'm hoping to see how this project and topic is shaping each person, their company, and maybe soon the rest of the world. So by the time I'm done, maybe we'll all want to adopt a little huga. Let's see. I did, okay? I did, yeah. You know, with technology, you can find anything now. There you go. I uh, appreciate it, thanks. You're upstairs, right? Okay, so let me set this up. You two have embarked on this journey to um, share the meaning of the Danish word huga with, I'm going to say, the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you wanted to understand it, investigate it, and then then share it. Um, But... I want to start with a word because I think that most people in the in the U.S., maybe North America, aren't familiar with hookah. So what what is it? What does it mean? Sure. Well, um, hookah is a, an exclusively Danish word. Um, some people would argue that it came from a Norwegian word. Norway and Denmark were once one kingdom, and so there's some of the language that sort of um, bleeds over. But hookah is a Danish word that doesn't actually have a, a direct English translation. Although just last year it was put into the uh, Oxford English Dictionary. And oh. so it has a definition. Although like it actually is one of those definitions that uses another word that I have to look up, which I hate. I hate those kinds of definitions. So um, <laughs> it's like see reference, you know, yeah. it's yeah. kind of like that. <laughs> exactly. So um, I feel like maybe, uh, you know, if there are folks out there who are like me and they read like, you know, the Oxford uh, English Dictionary and then they have to look up, they have to get another dictionary to look up the, the actual definition. Um, it, it translates pretty loosely to um, a feeling, definitely. Like uh, not only is it 
in the definition, you know, that it's definitely a feeling, but everybody that we talked to, to harped on, or they used uh, the word feeling to explain it. So it's not um, something that you can buy or something that you can create um, too carefully. You can't, there's not like super specific ingredients that you can add together and make hygge per se. Um, although we can probably talk about, there are things that you can do to hopefully inspire it, but it's a feeling that you have when you're very um, safe and and comfortable with people. Um, although it can be alone, it's often with people that you feel comfortable and safe with. And um, it's it's a feeling of contentment and and sort of this um, presence in the moment and mm-hmm. and satisfaction. Oftentimes, it's associated with satisfaction with um, with what you have right now. And so that um, you can kind of feel and sense that there are all these other things like, you know, mindfulness and uh, all these other kind of nice feelings or nice uh, concepts that people are sort of um, flocking to right now. Um, but Huga is its own unique thing that sort of has connections to a lot of those other things, but it's definitely something special and different and unique. Did he nail it? That yeah. Was it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, you know, another way, um, trust was a big thing, like, as people were describing it, as we were interviewing them, uh, you know, the, the feeling of trust among, you know, everyone around you, everyone felt trust with each other and also like on the same level, like, you know, there's not someone trying to show off to be better. Mm -hmm. Um, there's not someone that's less than you. You're all very, you know, you're on that same level. That was, you know, that was a big thing that I think several people, uh, you know, Danish people that we were interviewing, they, they kept harping on that as well. Um, that, you know, you, you can't you can't have that level of trust. You can't have that that calmness if if you're competing with anyone. Unlike some of the words that you used, Rocky, of like mindfulness and you know so any of the things that are going around, those are things that we can adopt. Mm-hmm. Those are things that we can look toward and say, "Oh, I'm going to be more mindful." But the way that you describe huga doesn't sound like something I adopt, but maybe something I'm already experiencing and I don't know about it. So maybe it's awareness or, or how can I understand it better? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I think, um, speaking very directly to that, Mike Viking, the author of the little book of Hugo, which is, um, international bestseller. and, And we actually interviewed him while we were in, in Denmark. Um, he shared almost specifically that same quote. He said, you know, perhaps what we've done is given, people a word for something that they're already doing. Um, and, and perhaps why Denmark is so um, sort of good at it is that they have a word for it and therefore they um, they place more value on it. Mm. Um, he actually has a really interesting part in his book. It's one of my favorite sections of his book where he talks about words in various cultures that exist only because there was a need for it. Right. And so um, there are all these bizarre words in the world and I won't be able to come up with any of them because frankly, some of them were so random. I couldn't mm. possibly remember them, but there are words in, in languages in different cultures that you would you just wouldn't need a word for that. Cause you're thinking like, what in the, why in the world would they, but for them, it was really, really important. Um, and, and so there's some question or some, or some um, maybe justification for having a word like Huga in uh, Scandinavian specifically, but, but in Denmark um, specifically, I guess, um, because of the, the need for that coziness and, and, and feeling of safety, um, maybe because of the, the long winters, the weather, mm-hmm. um, so on and so forth. The, the one thing about hygge that's different from any of those other words, similar words, is that it's also a verb. And so um, this was another thing that, that Mike Viking brought up. He said, you know, well, um, the fact that it's a verb means that we um, we talk about it in that active sense. And so we say, hey, let's uh, get everybody together on Friday and hygge. And then when you're together on Friday, you look around and you think, oh, this is very hygge. It's nice. You know, it's 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 hygge. It's cozy. And then uh, on Monday, when you get back to work, you, you see some of your friends or whatever, and you say, oh, I remember back on, you know, Friday or Saturday, it wasn't that hygge, you know? And so it's, it, you're, they're talking about it so much more and mm-hmm. they're being deliberate about it. Um, and I think that in and of itself sort of like was an interesting thing for me was that like, oh, okay. So like, it's not just an adjective. It's not just a feeling then it's a, it's a verb. That means that like you can do it. Like, so that was another thing that kind of changed my viewpoint that like, it can't just be something that you just recognize, like you were saying, Mm -hmm. like it's also something active and I have to do it too. Um, and so that, that to me is something important that we should kind of grab hold of. Would you describe also like um, an activity around Huga in, you know, in Denmark? Like, 
that feeling, that feeling happens around something. So what's some, some of the typical things that you've seen? And maybe Zach, I'll give that one to you. Well, it, it's hard to, to, to attach it to like a specific activity. Um, you know, a common thing that you'll, you'll hear it about in, in Copenhagen, for example, is, you know, being at the bar with, with your friends, having a drink, you know, with, with friends or, or family or whatever it is. Um, but at one point on our trip, uh, while we were, where we were filming, one of the, uh, people that we were interviewing, um, that she invited us to have, she set up a, a bonfire outside that night and we were all just kind of sitting around hanging out, you know, we were finished filming or, or, you know, taking a little break and, uh, she just looked at me and Rocky and she said, this, this is it. You know, we were all sitting around, uh, drinking a cup of tea and just, just chatting, mm-hmm. you know, no, nothing serious, nothing urgent was, was happening. She was, she just kind of said like, this, this is it. This is what, what we're all talking about. You know, mm-hmm. this is what Huga is about. Um, just, just being relaxed, being comfortable, being happy and like, not just having that, but, but she went, you know, she goes as far to say, like, acknowledge it, like say this, this is it right now. Let's, let's appreciate that. Let's, let's take a moment to, um, you know, be grateful for, for being in this moment. So like, you know, we had people tell us that Huga for them was sitting and reading a book Mm -hmm. alone, people going into nature, you know, alone or with people going on a hike or, uh, on a bike ride, um, you know, eating food or cooking food, preparing things. Um, Christmas time is the most hoogly time of the year, you know, and, and pretty much everybody agreed on that. Um, and so the time with family, the time around, uh, around the fire, um, you know, was, it was important, but all of it stemmed back to that, what you were describing, which is that, um, people felt comfortable, mm-hmm. um, people felt safe. Probably grab some, a little bit of time with, with you guys, maybe one-on-one or something like that yeah. over in the conference room, just to talk yeah. about your experience with finding Hugo so far, like we talked about. Um, I think you remember I gave you those very specific instructions of what to say. <laughs> no. Okay, right. Yeah. What's your name and what do you do here at 12 Stars Media? Hi, my name is Brittany Downs and I'm the communications coordinator here at 12 Stars. So I spend a lot of time communicating timelines and other information about projects and helping the team stay on track. One of the things that I worked on was transcribing a lot of the interviews. Oh, you did so a lot of that. I didn't. I did. I did a lot of it, yes. A lot of other people did too, because there's so much. Would you just quickly explain what we actually are talking about this when you're transcribing this information? Sure. So when you're transcribing, you're listening to an interview. I listen to it at like half the speed or three quarters of the speed, and I'm typing down everything I'm hearing them say. And how much? <laughs> how many hours of interviews are there? I think we have around. I don't, I'm not even sure, 20, 25 hours. 25 hours that need to be transcribed. (laughs) And I mean, that's phenomenally crazy. How do you describe Huga? The typical thing is Huga is cozy. It's a feeling. Um, I would describe it kind of the same way. Rocky mentioned something that um, he thought it was the right time. And actually, he's not the only person. Yeah, there was a few people that said, it's like the right time in North America. Like, we kind of need some of Huga. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. I think not even from the political side of things, yeah. but even just social media. And we're always on the go. I'm always on the go. I'm looking at my phone um, on Pinterest, just comparing myself to other people and mm kind of thinking like, oh, this person, their life looks perfect on Instagram. Why isn't mine like that? And I think Huga kind of of like takes that away a little bit, Mm -hmm. like brings you back and um, is telling you like what's important in life. How, How did you go from that of being interested to, hey, we should make a whole film about this because I mean that's a giant leap. Because let me just say it because I don't I don't think we've said it here too. You're you're making this documentary on your own dime on your own time. This is not a client project, so you're spending money and time of your entire team on this. So yeah, take me to how that turned from this. This is super interesting idea to we should tell the world. Yeah. Well, let me start and then and then I'll pass it over to Zach because. Um, I started having conversations 
with a friend of mine in Denmark after our trip. And they were sort of one-on-one conversations. And, and as many of the things that, that we do, um, they sort of start with these totally crazy ideas that I have. And thank, thankfully, most of my crazy ideas never come to fruition because if they did, then we would just, you know, we'd all be sunk a long time ago. I'd like to report that Zach is smirking on the side here. <laughs> For our <laughs> listeners that don't because that. He knows. <laughs> yeah, he knows. He knows that most of my ideas are terrible. So I was thinking, let's go big. <laughs> um, like in June, uh, not even 30 days after we got back from uh, from Denmark, because I had this conversation actually that I never shared with anybody here or anybody else on the team for a while. And I had this conversation where I found out a little bit more about the word Huga. And um, the gentleman that I spoke with was um, actually uh, from the UK, and he, he's been living in Denmark for um, close to a decade, the better part of a decade. And he actually told me that he didn't really like the word, and he didn't really like the the culture around Huga specifically because um, it created an environment that was sort of closed. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, if you're if you're striving to constantly spend as much time as you can with those you feel safe around, then you're not inviting other people to, to be there. And as, as you can imagine, as, uh, you know, somebody from the UK living in Denmark, you know, that was, that was a challenge for him. And so I thought, well, okay, wait a minute now, hold on. There's a story because now we have two sides to this word and that's only like in the first 30 days of me hearing about it. So there's got to be quite a bit here. Mm. Um, and I just thought at that point we could do something about this. And, and frankly, at that point, I thought it might just be like a trip. Maybe we just go and we just explore this concept. And maybe that helps our company culture or our team culture. Um, and, and that was the extent of it. Uh, but then at the beginning of this year, we, we did some, uh, some research and we asked the team uh, to contribute some ideas. And maybe, Zach, if you want to chime in on that a little bit and then talk about how it turned into a documentary from there. Sure. Yeah. So earlier this year, um, it was coming up on our, our 10 year anniversary. So we said, we, we asked the question to the team, what should we do to celebrate our, our 10 years of, uh, you know, being in business. And there were a lot of, a lot of great ideas thrown out, but the one that we, we had everyone vote on it, we had a little voting uh, system put together and everyone voted on the idea of creating a documentary that could potentially, you know, positively affect the world. That's, Mm. that was, that was the goal. Um, was that one of the options or do they, was it like this a blank field or you gave them like multiple choices? Well, so everyone wrote up ideas on, on little sticky notes and then we stuck them on the wall. Then everyone had little circle stickers mm, yep. and that was where their vote was going. Right. And so they both them up or down. That so, sort of yeah, idea. yeah. So they, so, so everyone voted on the, on the documentary option. And then, you know, it's kind of like, what does that mean? Like that, that we, no one had talked about Huga or like what the documentary would be about at that point. And then, you know, Rocky's like, let's, let's make the documentary. Let's make that happen this year. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, we can, we can set, you know, four or five crew members, uh, to, to Denmark and we can, we can shoot this, you know, in a week or so, no big deal. And Rocky's like, no, no, this isn't just about the documentary. This is also about our team and just kind of our culture here. And we want to bring everyone. We want all 17, we want, we want to bring 17 people all the way over to Denmark and I'm thinking like, no way, like that's, that's, you know, we're paying for all of this. There's no way we can make that happen. Um, but we, we somehow did, I guess, you know, it's, it's, you're kind of looking back and you're like, gosh, how, how did we make that happen? How are we still here now? You know, how are we still in business? I, I don't know. But, but, uh, we're, we're working hard and we're, um, we're working on the film, uh, as we're balancing, working on producer work to, to kind of balance that out. As you can imagine, um, everybody said, let's make a documentary film. And that was sort of like, it was unprompted. Like you asked, you know, well, was that one of the options? No, it wasn't. Like the only thing that we prompted them with was here are, we kind of put like a Jeopardy board up on a PowerPoint slide and said like, here are a bunch of things that are coming up. Write down ideas that you think kind of apply to them. And so one of them was, you know, we have a 10 year anniversary this year. Do you got any ideas for how to celebrate it? Then there were other things too, like how do we onboard new employees? And do we have, you know, a company you know team handbook to help with you know policies and things like that were all kinds of things it ran ran the gamut um and, and we have other ideas that came out of that but the one that that got the most votes was that documentary um and so it's kind of like i went okay everybody wants to make a documentary i've been thinking about this hygge thing and i just sort of hijacked it and stuck them together and i was like well we're gonna make a documentary about hygge and so how did i convince them of that 
Um, the same way I convince everybody about everything is I divided them all up often individually and I talked to them about it and sort of planted the seed here and there um, and tested it out. And um, if I had gotten a lot of like, that's a terrible idea, oh, then we wouldn't have done it. But, but it didn't happen that way. Because um, as we were talking about earlier, I have a lot of terrible ideas. But they usually get stamped out pretty early because I talk to people about them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll have a conversation with Zach and Zach will say, that's a terrible idea. And then I'll go, oh, honey, Zach said this was a terrible idea. And she'll go, mm, yeah, he's right. And I'll go, all right, fine. You know, and then maybe I'll talk to one other person here and they'll go, I don't even know what you're talking about. And I'll go, wow, okay, definitely no. Um, but I pulled aside, you know, Braden, our creative director, um, Joe, our director of photography, uh, a couple of other team members and told them that I had been learning about this concept of Hugo in Denmark and that maybe that's what we should make the documentary on. And they were all like, yeah, let's, let's do it. What's your name and what do you do here at 12 stars of media? Uh, my name is Tyson Cox and I am, I guess I've settled into becoming an animator here, but I'm mostly in post-production editing and uh, animation mostly. Did you know anything about Huga? No. There was a, a video that they showed of all of us like picking a piece of paper with the word Huga on it and we were all trying to pronounce it without having heard it. And <laughs> I think everyone, it was, it was surprising how many different ways you can mispronounce a word. Um, but there was like Heige and... Uh, uh, Hege was a big one. So there was a Hege. Yeah, Hege. Yeah, there was a, quite a few different ways to, but no, nobody even had heard of the word, which is weird because apparently it was like, apparently like up for like word of the year or something, which I, I, to be fair, I don't know who makes those decisions or where you find that out. But Rocky said mm -hmm. like 2016, it was up for word of the year and none of us had heard of it. So have you started to notice anything different about like the, the way that you maybe focus on that stuff now or my now that you have a different awareness of it on my phone when, like i'm taking pictures a lot i'm being very deliberate in what i take pictures of mm. i used to like snap a ton of photos when i'd go somewhere and then like when i go home i realize i don't actually remember what the room looked like i was too busy like taking all these pictures and i'm showing all the pictures like oh this is an awesome museum or, or something and but then i won't actually have a, a personal memory from it i'll remember looking at my phone how have you been more deliberate in ex experiencing or being present? One thing, I, one thing I did kind of as like a, a challenge when we went to Denmark, um, and I'm sure people are tired of hearing me talk about it because we I, we did like a blog post on it a little while ago. But um, I took like a watercolor set with me, mm. and so when we'd go to a new location, like when we we traveled to Denmark, England, and then Iceland, and so each place that we went, like I would try to find. A, a, like a 15 minute window and just kind of sit and I had this like travel kit and would paint. And I have more memories from looking at like, it was a, a little, like, I guess river that was running through town and the different colored buildings, very, uh, Denmark. It, it felt very much like, uh, Copenhagen. And, and so I was like painting that and I'm not a very good painter. What that wasn't, the point wasn't to have a painting that I could frame. It was more, I'm looking and I'm translating what I see onto paper. And like you're really absorbing it. Really absorbing it. And wow. so I I came back, I showed the pictures, and everyone's like, oh, that's nice. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. But I remember like when we were in Denmark and I was doing it, um, a couple of my team members, like Zeph and a couple others were sitting next to me. And I remember what we were talking about. And, and like I, I feel like I have a full memory around just that moment as opposed to like taking my phone out, snapping 20 pictures that – I'll probably keep one and, yeah. and, and not really have looked. Let me change gears. Let's talk about documentaries. Mm -hmm. As somebody who doesn't make documentaries, I've still consumed them and I've noticed there's been a spike in them a lot lately. And the, uh, and large vehicles or platforms like Netflix. Uh, Netflix just produced one the other day that came out. And there's a lot of award-winning ones, and not just at the festivals, but things that are doing really well um, uh, in like profit margin as well, which is surprising. So this is a whole new world is the way I kind of see it. I'm curious about if you have an insight to some of this. Do you, Is there a reason why maybe there's so more popular today or doing well today than there were maybe 15 years ago and that could be a guess you don't have to have analytics do you, I was gonna say, do you have a guess zach i have a guess yeah i mean i, I would say the I, 
I, I feel like the idea of, of real people, real stories have, you know, that's become a lot more attractive to the general public mm-hmm. um, in the past couple of years. Um, you know, you have so many Hollywood movies that are, you know, obviously all scripted out and they're actors, they're, they're pretending to be someone else um, to where it's like, you know, where, where are the real people? You know, I want to see a real person who's, who can be a real hero. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe they're a, a chef or they're a something, but you know, they, someone who, who really cares about what they're doing, really believes in what they're doing. I think, yeah, I think people are, are have become a lot more attracted to that, uh, that idea. That's a big part of my guess as well. Um, I think people are always attracted to human stories, like, like, you know, the, the triumph of the human spirit, you know, in, in whatever capacity, whether it's an athlete or whether it's a scientist or whether it's somebody overcoming, you know, terrible odds or whatever it might be. Um, but I think that like the interesting thing about the climate that we're in right now, when it comes to visual media, um, I think there is something there that I haven't got my finger put quite on just yet, but I think it's a combination between lots of different things. Like for example, um, the, you know, mass introduction of user generated video content that we've seen in the last, you know, decade where all of a sudden, you know, we could record video on our phones and then we could post it and then we can make live videos. And then, you know, just uh, now, um, I think Christopher, you and I were talking earlier, like you can't open Facebook or LinkedIn even anymore without like seeing somebody talking to you about something. Um, and so the interesting thing is that like social media has made, I think the world aware of each other more like, you know, like, it's made the world a smaller place at the same time. The other thing that's been happening simultaneously is that there's been, because of that accessibility, there's been so much more content, um, that it's kind of, I think opened the door for the quality gap to be bigger too. In that like, okay, I can only watch so many of my friends talking about, whatever it is that they're talking about on Facebook, like so much, right? Like I want somebody who really knows how to make something really, really good. Tell me a really interesting human story. Like you've piqued my interest world. Like, okay, I get it. Like there's all these places that I've never seen, never even heard of, never knew existed. There's all these people with all these different perspectives on life and different blah, 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 blah. The list goes on and on. But I, I kind of want to see something done really, really well. <laughs> like, it, like, you know, it's does like that make sense? This, yeah, absolutely. I think you've just connected the dot for me a little bit. Like the social media and this user generated content has piqued our interest. And now really good documentaries and, and similar media is helping us see what we really want to see. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah, I can only see my friends talk about so much of a food or thing that they're doing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> absolutely. What's your name and what do you do at 12 Stars Media? I am Glenn Johnson. I'm an editor here at 12 Stars. Did you learn anything else out of it as, and not meaning the topic, right. but through the experience, uh, maybe it was in a skill or meeting these interesting people and traveling? Yeah, uh, both of those. Um, from an editing standpoint, and I'm not sure how technical you want me to bring get it on <laughs> <laughs> i mean really up and up until now um it's starting editing through huga i'd say the biggest project i worked on probably had maybe you know two hours tops of interviews and that would be a lot that would be overwhelming if there was two hours of interview content um with you know 100 b-roll clips um so now take going from that to 20 to 30 hours of interview content that's all kind of you know working towards a similar message or goal and you know i don't even know how many hours of b-roll we have to also work through and a lot of that b-roll also has sound bites within that that could be integrated in it's just a totally different mindset that you have to take of letting the film just kind of be because with shorter videos that we make if they're three to five minutes long You have to cut out every empty space. You have to cut out every um, every and. Um, But now this is just kind of letting it letting it breathe. So it's taken for me a big um, mental shift to to think about it in an hour and a half versus a five minute Mm -hmm. documentary from an editing standpoint. Um, So that's been a huge skill 
Um, and I think it'll be really cool at the end to, you know, I ha even be able to ha say that I had a little piece of working on this huge full length feature project. So, um, that'll be cool in terms of meeting people. Yeah. I, I actually had this moment a couple weeks ago when I was watching through some of the footage, I left college to work here and I'm only 20, 20 years old. So this is like a pretty big, you know, like step in my life to join the company and everything. And, um, I had this like realization that without this company, some of these people that I met over the past, you know, year, um, I would never have known they existed. I would have never known their stories. And, you know, when we went to Canada, we went to this, these people's houses and we shared a meal with them for an hour, an hour and a half. We just sat and talked and like having this realization that, um, there are so many other people out there, like just this little house in the middle of Winnipeg, Canada, that I would have never known existed. These people I never would have met. Yeah. It's, it's kind of an overwhelming, overwhelming feeling. And, um, I've had that kind of feeling a lot throughout this project, but so that's been a huge kind of growing for me as well. This will be easy for Rocky. Um, so let me, <laughs> it'll be for Zach. What do you hope to do more of after the film? Okay, so I would say for, for 10 years now, we've been making these two, three minute videos, you know, that are, that are used online. And I would say, um, certainly since, since starting this documentary, we, we've wanted to be able to tell more of this, of the stories that, that we're telling, not just, you know, Hey, here's a little teaser of, of something that's cool, but here's, you know, here's a full story. Here's a, as much detail as we can possibly tell about it as much that is important anyway. And so what that looks like, I, I don't think we're, we're sure yet. Sure. Um, but I mean, you know, maybe that'll, that'll affect the work that we're doing with, with our clients. Um, but as far as another documentary that, that we'll be funding, I don't know. I don't know yet. <laughs> I already have two in mind. <laughs> as I said, this would not be difficult for Rocky to answer. <laughs> but just because I have those ideas, as sure. we've talked about, doesn't mean <laughs> they should or will come to any amount of fruition. So we'll see. Oh, again, I think it goes full circle here, right? Back to the dynamic. Yeah. You're bringing a lot of these great ideas, but and I think it's really fair, Zach, to say that you don't know exactly what it looks like, but that's kind of where you're aiming. Like you've learned a little bit through this process. I'm sure you've learned a lot, mm -hmm. but one of those things that sticks with you is like, can we tell a bigger, deeper story? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and we grow and change so much, you know, like we went to Disney World as a team, you know, uh, back in 2015. And, you know, like it might have been pretty easy for us after that was over to say like, oh, yeah, totally. That's something we should do like as often as we can so that, you know, our team can understand what it's like to sort of experience like best in class customer service and best in class attractions and things like that. And it's like, that yeah, may be true to some extent, but then something like this comes your way and you think, wow, you know, like this is different. This is new. Let's try that. And I don't know. I think we go back and forth because, um, and now I'm going to completely contradict myself, which is um, typical. Typical. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've also experienced that um, constantly changing um, it takes a lot of energy. Right. And so if we can find something that we can put all of our energy in and um, not have to expel that energy changing things pretty consistently, um, then we may be able to accomplish more, which could be pretty cool. And so that's where, you know, if you if you forced me to say, like, how will things be different? And you're not that kind of person. You're not forcing me to do anything. I would say that we're sort of settling down a bit. We're not trying as many completely new and revolutionary sure. things, but we're going to, um, I think, take on bigger projects more frequently so that we can invest the energy there. 
you know, rather than trying something new all the time, we're going to kind of yeah. stick to what we can. You need some breathing room as well. You can't have constant change. Yeah. Absolutely. Nobody likes that. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. Let's start with this. Um, what's your name and what do you do here at 12 Stars Media? So I'm Joe Frank and I am the director of photography at 12 Stars Media. So I am involved in some level um, on pretty much every shoot that happens, um, whether it's planning how the shoot is going to look, how the video is going to look, or actually shooting it myself. So, Did you have a like a thought or influence of what you wanted it to look like, especially when this wasn't your first initial maybe wish to do yeah as far as the cinematography itself like we went back and forth on exactly how to do it what makes the most sense related to Hugo. like even just does it make more sense to have the camera on your shoulder and have it more organic or does it make more sense to have it locked down on a tripod Mm -hmm. static like smooth and stuff like that so there was a lot of like internal discussion with me and and several other people about like the style and the feel the feel of it i am very much like uh i like to get in there with the camera up in people's faces like just getting mm. really close and personal with people Almost and it's like a, this raw getting yeah, the emotion or connection exactly um which you'll see in a lot of documentaries that's that and even a lot of like uh commercials and stuff like that they the camera's moving organically like all the time but then there were other people on the team that were like well that's cool. But there are also moments in this film, I think where it needs to be like very set up and very like symmetrical and Mm -hmm. like, and, and I, I agreed with that. And that's something that like, I think as a team, we're, we're good at like kind of balancing all those different styles. Um, so again, that's, it all kind of like the style of the film, the look of it just kind of grew out of those discussions, I guess. As I was reading about Huga and this whole idea I started thinking about like times in my life that I feel like were Huga. Mm. Um, and I, I never had a word for it. I never, uh, never tried to put a word to it. Um, you know, this feeling of like when you're maybe at the end of a party or something like that, and you're just with that core group of friends that stays around and you're sitting around a campfire or something like that. Um, and you're just hanging out and it's like that, you know, you, you don't want to leave. And I've had that in, at certain times in my life. It's not just that I didn't have a word for it. It's that I didn't know that I didn't have a word for it. It's not even something that I thought, oh, I like that experience. I should try to have more of those. Um, and it was kind of an eye-opening thing. It was like, why don't I try to have hmm. more experiences like that? Yeah. Um, and I think like having a word for it is kind of like this, like if I have a way to describe it to myself at least, um, I can be like, well, why am I not trying looking for those Huga experiences mm. that, you know, that you could be more intentional? Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks, guys. It's been good. <laughs> I feel like we, we went all over the place. <laughs> not really. That's good. Though. I took you exactly where I wanted you to go. It was only good. at the end. There was yeah. a couple like extra questions I wanted to put in there. No, I think it's just my head felt like I was all over the place. <laughs> well, but yeah. Yeah. But that's kind of how you work, right? That's where your ideas come from. Basically. Yeah. yeah I know how that works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've just landed back in San Francisco after spending a full day uh, 12 stars, getting to know a lot about that team and about Huga, and then exploring Indianapolis. I think I understand Huga a lot more now. Right after the interview, I spent a day and a half with my friends experiencing Indianapolis and meeting some new people. Prior to this trip, I hadn't seen my friend David in over a decade. And truthfully, we were never really close friends. I couldn't help but wonder before arriving, would we still be people that even liked each other? Uh, Truthfully, I was a little nervous about it. But by the end of my time with David, we both admitted having similar thoughts about it, but also realizing how wonderful it was to reconnect. So my time with David and Jason and their friends 
It felt like an easy, cozy time with good friends. I think I found Huga, or at least the beginning of it for me. Finding Huga has just started making its way through film festivals. To learn more about the film and to find out where it's screening, go to findinghugafilm.com. And Huga is spelled H Y G G E. You'll find photos of my adventure to Indianapolis as well as more about 12 Stars Media on the episode webpage. So if you head over to mybigstory.show, you'll find that as well as other episodes. Then you should come join me over on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at me, Christopher, and you'll find more photos of my adventures and you can join a conversation. I'm also on Facebook at The Christopher Swan. Then for all the creative solopreneurs and dreamers out there, you should check out my insights for dreamers and doers at ChristopherSwan.info. I'm now writing about my experiences and sharing advice. So if you sign up for the Be Inspired newsletter at the same spot, you'll get the latest insights delivered straight to your inbox. And last thing, and this is a big one. If you like content like this, specifically this show, a great way to let me know is to write a review for the show on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. See, this helps others find the show and that allows me to continue the show. So that'd be awesome. So I think that's it. That's it for this adventure. I'm Christopher Swan, and this is my big story. 